We're still focusing on 2011 returns for the S&P 500 index and we're now focusing on dividends for that period. Could be over to you. Yeah, I mean, let's let's have a look at the dividend flow. I mean, I, I, and by the way, if you just have a look at your screen over there, what I had to do is I needed to put 1960 to 1969 all in one block because you can see how many times in the year, um, how many years dividend flows are actually up by 0 to 0.10%. And that's just interesting to note because, again, like South Africa, corporates globally try and keep dividend flows quite stable because that's what keeps investors interested in actually owning companies. If you've got dividends that fall back, um, you know, that, that's generally not very good for investor sentiment. And if you have accelerating dividends, people come to expect that kind of dividends. So on the back end of that, let's have a look how the last four years kind of panned out on, uh, for the S&P 500. And there you can see 2009, a complete outlier, very, very similar to what we saw in South Africa, um, minus 20 to minus and minus 30% in 2009 as far as dividend flow is concerned. 2010 and 2011, you know, average years in 2011 obviously being a fairly decent year. 2008 not being a bad year as far as dividend flow is concerned. Slightly different picture in, uh, in South Africa, obviously. 2011, dividends increased by 30 and 40 percent. So we're not seeing that in the international market. I actually wanted to mention this, and Roland, uh, the South African market doing far better with regards to dividend flows when you juxtapose this against the S&P 500 over 50 years. It seems that South Africa just pays higher dividends. Yes, look, you've got to split the market into different sectors. So you've got resources and industrials and financials, and they're obviously all different. But um, when we look at dividends, typically the companies have a, have a bit of a challenge because they use dividends to entice investors to buy their shares, but they don't want to pay away too many of the dividends because they need that capital to grow their business. And I think in the last two years, it's been especially difficult for companies to make that decision because you have to now decide, I, I can't upset the investors because now I really need them. Um, but I also need to keep that money to, to, to grow the business. So um, dividends are, are, are scarce at the moment. And I think those companies that can afford to pay dividends um, are going to do very well. And Roland, I mean, we saw the strengthening of balance sheets after the crisis as well. So that's why companies held on to their cash. And then we started to see a lot of share buybacks as well, as opposed to returning funds to shareholders. And also acquisitions seem to be the name of the game. So a lot of different trends that are... It depends occurring. entirely on, on the cash position that, the, that these companies have. And, and obviously, uh, different companies will have a lot more or less cash, especially after the, the recent um, sort of crisis that we've had. But the, 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 an interesting number to, to keep an eye on is not necessarily the dividends or the dividend yield, but what we call the payout ratio. In other words, how much of the earnings are paid out as, as dividends. And that has come down from about 45% to, to 35%. So um, a third of the earnings are paid out as dividends. And I think that watching that ratio is important because as soon as that starts ticking up, it's telling you that companies are confident enough to actually reimburse those investors and they can afford to grow their business. Mm. I mean, I think the other important thing is let's have a look at the, uh, the, the 1990s period over there. And you'll remember that earnings actually fell during those periods whilst markets were actually doing the re returns were actually quite yeah. robust. But look at what happens to dividend flows. It stays quite stable. Have a look at the 1990s numbers there. Always up between between 0 and 10 percent. It stays stable because companies, as Roland quite rightly said a little bit earlier on, they want to entice investors to continue to be involved in actually owning these companies rather than selling those. It also has to do with the fact that many corporate executives are actually paid in, in, in shares and they own vast portions sometimes of some of, these, uh, some of these corporates and they obviously can make money on the back end of that. Let's fit a distribution curve to the S&P 500 dividends and you can see just how how, how tall their distribution curve is. It's um, mostly kind of most of your dividend payments pays happen in a very, very narrow band. Well, it's a fascinating to note. I mean, we, in 2008, uh, we saw the first half of the year quite good, and then towards the end of the year, it was a really tough year. And this is why the S&P, from a returns perspective, actually lost uh, around 40% or so. And then dividends were relatively stable throughout the 2008 period. It's yeah. quite an interesting point, You've you got to keep that, that game going as a company, because if you, stop, if you start lowering your dividends, you're going to lose even more confidence. And that's what's reflected only so in 2009. So it's like a last resort kind of, you've got to keep those dividends uh, ticking over. Uh, with regards to uh, when looking at uh, the earnings, the returns, and the dividends mm. for last year, mm. would you say the S&P 500 has actually had a positive, a strong performance relative to what we see in the emerging market space? I think that if you look at the if you look at the S&P 500, it's done it's done well in a year with lots of volatility. It's done as 
as one could potentially expect it to do in a world which is very, very uncertain. And that's on the back end of the European crisis. But that does not take away the fact that the 14 times earnings this thing is trading off at the moment is a fairly decent valuation. Why, I mean, the JSE All Shares sitting at a PE ratio of around 14 times remember, as well. So uh, why don't we buy into the, the JSE All Shares as opposed it's, to it's, S&D? It's about risk premium. So, you know, the normal thinking would go, and I'm not saying that's going to be a thinking that we have in a decade from now in the market, but certainly over the last half a century, you would want to, you're assuming a lot more risk by being in an emerging market than you were in the Western markets. Now, that might not be the case with the fact that... Well, on a relative was, basis, that's changed now. The emerging markets are on a risk-adjusted basis more attractive than they've ever been before. Yeah, but I mean, if you just look at the two valuations, so if you look at the South African market, it's sitting for 14 times earnings, and you look at the S&P 500, and that's it's sitting on a 14 times earnings basis. So which one do you rather buy? Where the do higher growth is, which is not in, in the S&P or, or in Europe. Maybe, but one should maybe also consider that there's a lot of multinationals here with emerging market exposure, whereas sure. in a lot of emerging market uh, countries, you've got companies which are exposed specifically only to emerging markets and then often very specifically into one geographic or mm. specific geographic areas. Mm. So maybe from a diversification perspective, you know, I'm still buying the fact that international equities are, are cheap relative to the emerging market peers. You know, if we had PEs coming back in the South African market, say for instance, to nine PEs and 10 PEs, then maybe we'd, one could say, well, that's a lot more attractive. Now, that might happen during the course of the year, especially if earnings you know, continue to revert. And that's a wait and see game. Mm. Uh, with regards to the, some of the issues that we've seen, the Eurozone seems to be relatively stable. We saw Chinese growth clocking in at 8.9% for the fourth quarter. It's not a bad number, but it's a two year low. Um, a lot of talk of monetary policy. What kind of returns are you expecting into 2011 for the S&P, for the overall developed market? Things look slightly healthier. But yeah, I say I mean, that reluctantly. Our, our um, U.S. strategists are, are saying that uh, earnings growth in the U.S. will be quite uh, mediocre, in other words, in line with nominal GDP growth, which is around about 6%. And they're not expecting any uh, um, re-rating in, in the valuations or the PE in the market. So they're expecting quite low returns, single-digit returns for the U.S. market uh, over the next year. Um, but I do think that uh, if you had a choice, you still want to be um, where, you, where, you, where you're going to get that growth. And I know that China is, is slowing, but there are some positive signs um, in terms of uh, Europe even and uh, the other emerging markets in terms of commodity prices are still quite robust. Are you robust. buying up um, so U.S. market stocks? I, I wouldn't, on a, on a, if I had a global choice, I certainly wouldn't be investing in the U.S. Uh, as Even yet. with a P of 14. Even with a P. Last time it was at the P for 1998. But you see, say? that's the market P. And I mean, in, in between, the, you know, in the midst of a 14 PE, if you go and you actually stock pick, um, you know, you could actually find fairly decent businesses yes, of much true. lower price to earnings ratios. And maybe, and I don't know if Ronald would agree with this, but maybe the, maybe the international market is much more a stock picking market today than just a directional market that you can but just the, buy. But there are two market. types of stocks you can pick. You can pick a cheap stock on a PE basis, which is a, a value stock. And then the other one is you, you choose a stock that pays you. Income, in other words, a high dividend yielding stock, and I do think personally that I would prefer to have the income when growth is low. So, if I had to choose stocks in the US or in South Africa where growth is actually quite low, you want to have steady income rather than waiting for that PE to give you a capital gain because the capital gain will only come back when risk appetite mm -hmm. returns. I mean, I look at some screens and I'm seeing some really decent companies of 4% dividend yields. Now, I mean, if yes. you're picking up those businesses of 4% dividend yields, you know, and you've, you're sitting with very low inflation in those kind of environments, maybe as a retired individual, maybe this is something that you might be and, wanting And those to are your retailers, your telecoms, and um, some industrial yeah. shares. Uh, so, so, so we know last week Kirby did not want to commit uh, to giving us his view with regards to the JSE All Share Return for 2020. Let's see if he'll give us a uh, commitment now for the S&P 500 return for 2012. As, I, as, I, as I continuously say, tell Eleni, I do not forecast markets. And it's a very dangerous thing to forecast markets because you're invariably either going to be right and then a hero or you're going to be completely wrong. <laughs> so let me, let, me, let me maybe focus your attention maybe on the distribution curves. Let's fit. If you look at your screen over there, you'll see earnings and you'll see dividends and you'll see returns and you see how those kind of fit together and there you can see if you have a look at returns and you have a look at how returns look through time and you have a look at that relative to share earnings you can see the two curves actually look quite similar and that's maybe an efficientist type answer where people say well look how efficient this market is you know returns and earnings look quite similar over time um, and uh, you know and, and that's not necessarily the case that we're seeing in emerging markets and in specifically South Africa if I just show you the dotted line if I take those 2009 numbers out of the return numbers you'll see what those look like and there's a dotted line and you see that's even more fitted to uh, to to share returns I mean would you agree with that I mean the international market so slight is is more efficient than what emerging markets are um, uh, the, the tests are, are pretty um, 
conclusive that, that uh, markets in the long run are, are certainly uh, efficient. Um, I think that uh, what you have in uh, emerging markets are a lot more friction. So there's a lot more um, you know, sovereign risk and, and costs and li liquidity issues. So big things can, in the short term, be less efficient in emerging markets. But in the long run, there isn't much evidence to show that they are totally in, okay, uh, so inefficient. So just to reiterate, 2012, you say that it's going to beat nominal GDP, so above 6% return for... Single S digit total returns is what, what our strategists in the US are saying. Well, thank you very much for committing to that. You see, you see the analysts here. You. You, see the, you see the sell side analysts. They prepare to commit to things, you see. Now, <laughs> let, me, let me say this as a, as a, as a parting shot. 2011 returns were anemic in the, in the global space. It was anemic in the emerging market space, and at some point these, these earnings are going to turn around. Do you want to own equities? Absolutely. There's nothing that's in the system that's going to be a shock to the system that potentially will send earnings down. Or, I've been interviewing you for four down. years, and you've been saying that you want to. Uh, we should be owning equities for the last four years. So nothing much has changed. <laughs> well, because you've because you've known me since <laughs> the crash the in 2008. <laughs>